Hello, this is Dr. Ornbrink, trying to give people a little overview of what to do with their chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS. It's a very complex illness. Congratulations, you've got it. Now, what, can we, what are we going to do about it? It's a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. Many unusual symptoms and moving parts are present in this thing, so the body has many systems involved, each of which will produce their own symptoms. The most important task at hand is to learn more about this illness. Knowledge is power, especially with this illness. Let's start by teaching the basics. First, where can we get more information? Start with our website at appwell.net. I've got a lot of information there that I think will be very helpful to our, list, our watchers, listeners, and patients in general. Uh, it's also for the general public. For those who are patients of ours, you have access to the table of contents document that I've been creating. It's an ongoing work in progress. There are numerous videos and documents that can be looked at there. It'll give you more information as well. Let's talk about the visual contrast sensitivity testing, the little gray lines present at vcstest.com. $15, 15 minutes. What it's doing is testing how well the mitochondria, the power plants inside the cells, are doing in terms of their adenosine triphosphate production, ATP production. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. This is what powers all life as we know it. This test measures how well the retina, the rod cells, specifically the black and white receptors in the back of the eye, discriminate between subtle shades of gray. If the mitochondria and the retina don't work well, either do the mitochondria and the rest of your body. They also are producing lactic acid, lactate, and pyruvic acid, pyruvate, which tissues really don't like to swim in. So if you've got this going on, you're not using oxygen. You're not taking things, carbons all the way down to carbon dioxide and water. You're producing these acids. You're also only generating about 30% of the ATP that you need. If the mitochondria in the eye are not working right, they don't work right anywhere else either. So it's very important to assess mitochondrial function. Now these Mitochondria may be malfunctioning because of toxins in your home. And there's a quick and dirty test I like to do for your homes. It's a BCS test, first thing in the morning at home upon awakening. Leave the house for 12 hours. Stay outdoors as much as possible. Repeat this test on the same laptop or tablet. No phones. The BCS is not very accurate on a telephone. If the test improves away from home, that's a pretty good indication that you're hosting some mold in your house. Now, I want to review that you do not necessarily have a mold infection. Your building may have a mold infestation, but there's a big difference. You're having intoxication from the toxins, the mycotoxins, mold toxins, or VOCs, volatile organic compounds, produced by the mold. These BCS tests is pretty inexpensive. It can be done anytime you have a change in symptoms that don't make any sense to you. Remember, you have a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. Most physicians will not be able to make sense of the various crazy symptoms that we get. So if things change, it's a good idea to do a VCS test to see is this change due to mold-related illness or something to do with SIRS, chronic inflammation, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or could this be just another change? Maybe you're coming down with the flu or something. Redo the VCS test. If it's improved or unchanged, it's probably not SIRS related, but if you have a worsened VCS test, then probably there's something related to mold. You can do the split test VCS test as well, uh, checking your home and then away from home. Uh, it costs about $30 to do that. Mold testing will be at least two to $300, so you'll save a lot of money if you do the split sampling with a VCS test. It just takes a little bit of your time and a small amount of your money. This can also be done in other buildings, such as at work. I've had school teachers who we've been able to find and document that the problem that they were suffering was not from their home, but was from their school. Uh, and that's something that has been very useful in the past. So we can work you through that as well. The omega fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids are anti-insaturated. Omega-6s have an inflammatory effect. There's a ratio between six and three that ratio is important. The American diet is about the inverse of what it should be. 
in terms of 6 and 3. The Mediterranean diet is much better in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects that we like to see. Ideally, you should be getting 2 grams, 2,000 milligrams of omega-3s every day. So like 2 twice a day. Uh, another one I like is Core Omega. It is a brand of omega-3s. It tastes like an orange creamsicle. It comes with a little uh, metal pouch. It has 1,200 milligrams in it, so you can get dessert after each meal by taking one of these things, and you're getting 3,600 milligrams, which is a pretty good amount. Mitochondrial support can be done in other ways as well. L-carnosine is an amino acid. 500 milligrams three times a day can help. CoQ10, ideally, as ubiquinol, not the ubiquinone, is also important for proper mitochondrial function. Some people respond well to guafenicin, the active ingredient in mucinex. Taking about twice the dose four times a day can help some people. It's worth a try. Uh, the one side of uh, one caveat on it, excuse me, is salicylates cancel out this benefit. So if you're using aspirin, anything that has, says wintergreen on it for taste or smell or what have you, that will cancel out the effect. Uh, read the labels to make sure you're not getting the salicylates. And in terms of the source of guafenicin, uh, I do not recommend Mucinex. I re recommend the generic store brand. It works better. Binders are the most important class of medicine that we prescribe, bar none. Binders remove toxins from the body through the colon. If you scroll down in your Google folder spreadsheet, you'll find the Ermi Hurts Me Too tab. And if you scroll down toward the bottom of that tab, you'll learn more about the various species of mold that are involved, what toxins they produce, and what are the best binders for the specific toxins involved. Cholestyramine is generally the most effective agent. It works best with, after taking in any kind of a fatty food, even a couple of spoonfuls of peanut butter or of some avocado. Fat triggers the gallbladder to release bile into the duodenum. So if you're not eating a fatty meal, the bile is not being uh, put into the small intestine. And if you're not getting bile in the small intestine, the cholestyramine really does not work very well. Those who have had their gallbladder removed can take the, stuff, the cholestyramine pretty much any time they want to, however. The next prescription medicine that works would be colcevalem or Wellcol. It's only about 20% excuse me, as effective as cholestyramine. So cholestyramine is a much more efficient remover of toxins than the colcevalem. There are numerous other binders that are also much less effective and slower acting, but will produce fewer side effects as well. Strong binders can produce adverse symptoms for those with large body burdens of toxins. So sometimes you have to go slow. Again, you take the binders just before meals, unless you've lost your gallbladder. Uh, cholestyramine is a yellow-orange powder. It tastes better when it's chilled. It has an orange flavoring to it. It has a gritty texture to it. What I do is I mix mine in about oh, 08 ounces of water, put it in a small glass jar, shake it up, stick it in the fridge. When I take a dose, and it has a chance to sit and hydrate, getting ready for my next dose, the longer it hydrates, the less gritty the texture is, and it tastes better. If you don't have a gallbladder, again, take it at any time. But if you are doing it, any time you take cholestyramine, take other medications one hour before or two hours after the cholestyramine, if possible. Cholestyramine might interfere with absorption of other meds and supplements. It's not a guarantee that it will, but it might. And just by changing the time course of when you're taking these things, that can take care of the problem. Maximum dose of cholestyramine is four times a day. Take as much as you can. You can also alternate with other binders. If you can't get a full four grams of cholestyramine in every day, then what you can do is take a little bit of cholestyramine, a little bit of well call, a little bit of some of the other things, and that works as well. Adverse effects. Constipation is the most common. High-dose magnesium supplements can relieve the constipation, but do not take the magnesium glycinate as it does not help the colon. Pretty much all the other magnesium supplements do help with, however, with the constipation. High-dose vitamin C, ascorbic acid, also loosens bowels when taken by mouth. This is known as bowel tolerance. It varies between people, but more vitamin C will be tolerated when you're sick. However, if you start to get better, you'll get back down to bowel tolerance, and you'll get loose stools to start getting rid of the excess vitamin C. Other binder choices. Michael Gray is a physician in the Southwest United States. He put together a protocol, which is in our library, the Apple Library found on our website. And it goes into binding protocols that involve a lot of over-the-counter products, such as 
that's uh, weaker, it's slower, better tolerated. The agents will include charcoal, activated charcoal, palm charcoal, etc. Charcoal should actually be taken in doses up to 30 grams, which is a lot per dose. Chlorella can be helpful. Clays such as bentonite and zeolite clay can help. There are numerous other binding agents available. Some say they, they remove heavy metals as well. Uh, but none of them are going to work as well as cholestyramine. And regarding the removal of heavy metals, I would really kind of like to see some data before I admit that, yes, they really do, as stated, uh, because they aren't really very much geared toward heavy metal removal. Um, lab studies. We try to keep the costs down as much as possible for our patients. Therefore, we try to use the major labs that the insurance companies will recognize and pay for as often as possible. Lab core is where we order most of our studies. We'll order two sets of labs to be done. The turnaround time on the first set is going to be four weeks. The second set is two weeks. You can have it all drawn all at once, but the volume will be like having a pint of blood donated at the blood bank. But it won't be going into a one pint bag. It'll be going into one tube after another tube after another tube. And some people get a little bit wigged out about the number of tubes that are being drawn. So that's why I broke it down into two separate sets of blood work to be done. And I like the lab core here in Nashville because they're used to working with some of the unusual labs that I order. Quest can be used as well for other insurance restrictions. Some uh, insurance companies don't like lab core, but they do like Quest. We can work around that. Um, insurance does not cover microbiology DX, which is what we use for Marcon's testing. They also do not recover the environment, environbiomics testing. That is basically looking for evidence of mold in your buildings. Uh, insurance companies, of course, aren't really interested in the buildings you may own or occupy. We have a large variety of other laboratories that we use as well. Insurers generally do not cover these. However, your insurance policy might check with your insurer. I have no idea what kind of policy you have and what it does or does not cover. No dog in that fight. So when you go to get some of these other testing uh, facilities used, you might want to just check with your insurance company and see what they say about it. But you can see there are several others that we use, and this is not an all-inclusive list. We can use others as well, depending on what's going on with you. We try to be a full-service complex chronic illness practice, and complex chronic illness covers a lot of territory. Imaging studies. My favorite by far is the NeuroQuant volumetric MRI. This is the most common form of imaging that we order. It can measure down to 0 0.1 millimeter, the size volumes of various brain structures. It can determine between inflammation and atrophy or shrinkage. Uh, it can help support the brain. We can help support the brain to promote healing. Inflammation will be generally enlarged over the 50th percentile of the mean. Atrophy or shrinkage will be smaller than the 50% of the mean. Uh, complex chronic illnesses will break down the blood brain barrier. And it will cause some parts of the brain to increase in size and other parts to decrease in size. Uh, labs through other imaging centers and hospitals are clinic as clinically indicated. We can give you orders if necessary to have whatever studies need to be done wherever necessary. We also occasionally do some in-office ultrasound studies, including the stress echocardiograms, which can also be arranged. Building inspection, testing, evaluation, and remediation. Remember, the first step of getting better is to eliminate all toxin exposure. You can't do that if you don't know what you're dealing with. So we do the Envirobiomics Swiffer testing. It uh, comes in two ways. The Hertz Me test looks at five species. The Ermi test looks at 26 species. Uh, a bit more expensive, but certainly worth it. Simple inspection is not enough. Uh, you really need to do some lab testing on this as well. There are some very good quote, uh, companies out there, well-qualified, and there are some companies that think they're great and they advertise how wonderful they are, but they really aren't worth the paper their business license is printed on. Uh, if they say that they're going to do air sampling as an initial test, they're probably not the company you want to deal with. Uh, if they're familiar with the Swiffer testing and how it works, then they're probably a better company. Or you could test yourself with the Swiffer test and you know, figure out a company after you do testing if your testing is positive. If your building has a problem, the Swiffer test should show problems. Air quality improvement. There's a difference between air filters and air purifiers. A filter removes, HEPA filters remove 99.7% of particles greater than 10 microns in diameter. Purifiers add. They add free radicals, 
charged particles that break mycotoxins of all toxins, volatile, also known as VOCs or volatile organic compounds, down to carbon dioxide and water, which of course are harmless. Ozone generators can also be used to degrade the toxins, but ozone can be harmful to the respiratory system. So please, no people or pets in the building while the generator is being run. It is okay to have plants in the building, however. Dehumidifiers, you want to maintain your indoor humidity less than 50%. There are systems that can be put right into your central HVAC systems, including things with ultraviolet light. It can be helpful. You can get probiotics for your building. An Israeli company found a way to isolate microbes that kill the mold that causes the toxins. Uh, that takes longer than using the antiseptic methods, such as the uh, air purifiers and dehumidifiers and such. But it's a kind of a neat concept. Uh, just puts a little puff of air into the room, and that air contains good germs that kill the bad germs, basically. They can even get inside of wall cavities. Fixing the brain is important. Complex chronic illness can break down the blood-brain barrier, which should be an impenetrable protector of the brain, more like a steel safe, and it becomes more like a sieve when the, the illness gets a hold of you. Uh, when this happens, you'll get a lot of brain problems. One of the big ones is it'll affect the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system comes in two flavors, sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, heal and renew. You cannot effectively heal and renew in the sympathetic state. You have to manually shift gears in your brain, and there are numerous ways you can do this. Dynamic Neural Retraining System by Andy Hopper. Heart Math is a cell phone app. Alpha Stim is a really cool device. It's about 800 bucks. It's expensive, but you put little clips on each earlobe, and it transmits the alpha frequency from one ear to the other, which entrains the brain. And if you're like very stressed and very upset, this thing can put you in just la la land nirvana within a matter of minutes. It's pretty amazing how well it works. Uh, Amazon has a cheaper knockoff called the KTS Sleep Aid, which is about $100. It's not quite as effective as the uh, Alpha Stim, but it still does a pretty good job. Craniosacral manipulation. We do have a local source who does a pretty good job of it that I recommend. I've had him treat me, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's Simon Newton. <clears throat> Acupuncture can be very helpful as well. Tapping, you can le learn more about that on our Appwell info, info doc document, patient information document. Mental health and therapy is also very, very important. Uh, we prefer to see therapists who have personal experience with complex chronic illness. We can make some recommendations. Um, and more information about these ladies would be in your paperwork as well. Low MSH is really kind of the key pivotal player in the complex chronic illness. It is a bridge between the brain and the endocrine or hormone system. So when there's a low MSH going on, because of this illness, your sleep quality is disrupted. You awake very tired and exhausted. You don't get restful sleep. Pain is amplified and magnified. GI issues, irritable bowel syndrome, pain, bloating, altered stooling will happen. Adrenal imbalances. The pituitary is the master gland of the adrenal of the endocrine system. Excuse me. It produces adrenocorticotropic hormone (ACTH), which tells that the adrenals to make more cortisol. Cortisol levels go up with stress and with inflammation, both of which this disease will cause. Initially, the adrenals make too much cortisol, but then eventually they'll burn out and they can't make enough cortisol. And as the cortisol tends to increase. You also get the sympathetic system activation going on. Low testosterone also happens. Men and women both need it. Low antidiuretic hormone, ADH. ADH concentrates the urine. When it's low, you're producing large volumes of dilute urine. You're wasting water, a condition known as diabetes insipidus, which has nothing to do with diabetes mellitus, which involves sugar. Diabetes insipidus does not involve blood sugar. Marcons, multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative Staphylococcus aureus. Marcon is a staph germ that can grow in the naso sinus. When it's present, it will lower MSH. When MSH is low, it encourages more Marcon's growth. You get a feed forward amplification loop. Marcon's forms a thick naso sinus biofilm. Thick naso sinus biofilm is spelled S N O T. 
and it's so thick it cannot you cannot get antibodies from the body's immune system through it to get to the microbes nor do antibiotics get through to the microbes very effectively body fluid deficiency with SIRS due to this low ADH your kidneys are wasting free water you can become very profoundly dehydrated your thirst mechanism can be impaired you may need hospitalization for IV fluids or you can concentrate on just drinking extra water even if you don't feel thirsty. And again, diabetes insipidus is a syndrome of inadequate ADH from formation. There's also the opposite of that, syndrome of inappropriate ADH, which involves the uh, osmolality and, and the antidiuretic hormone status of the body as well. And we do blood testing to maintain an idea of what's going on with your status for not only the adrenals and cortisol but also your ADH and osmolality and we treat as of, as you know necessary uh, we use desmopressin DDAVP to which is also used to treat children who went to bed we can also use oxytocin which is also known as the falling in love hormone which is what is present uh, made when women start breastfeeding a baby after they make the, you know, after they deliver the baby that contributes a lot to the maternal fetal bonding maternal infant bonding I should say Oxytocin is also that falling in love hormone that is released when you're infatuated with somebody. It's kind of hard to be stressed and depressed when you're infatuated. So if you're having problems with emotional illness, then the oxytocin can kill two birds with one stone. As far as the adrenals, initially they're producing too much cortisol. Okay. Uh, then they burn out, can't make enough cortisol. And when this is happening, you have muscle weakness, fatigue, weight loss, Increased skin pigmentation, even in areas not exposed to the sun, loss of tan lines is kind of significant. Loss of appetite, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and salt cravings. Cortisol excess is known as Cushing's syndrome. Cortisol or adrenal insufficiency is known as Addison's syndrome. The common parlance for that is adrenal fatigue. They're both diagnosed with blood testing. Initially, we try to catch it early and treat with botanical and herbal therapies. If necessary, though, we may need to use hydrocortisone to take care of that problem. Mast cell activation syndrome. The mast cells are part of the inflammatory spectrum of these complex chronic illnesses, which range from SIRS to mast cell to multiple chemical sensitivity to EMF sensitivity. Mast cells are important in terms of regulating inflammation, and when they're running amok, you get chronic inflammation that does not belong. So all of this is related to the total toxic burden that the body is carrying. Think of the straw that broke the camel's back. It's not the straw, it's the 50 bales of hay that went on that poor camel before the straw that caused all these problems. So the mast cells basically are like neighborhood cops. Their job is to keep everything in good working order, but if they go rogue and start putting out excessive inflammatory cytokines, mediators, then things will kind of go off the rails and we have to pull them back to where they belong. I've got a very good review of the mast cell activation syndrome on our table of contents document. Uh, mast cell activation syndrome is an integral part of the CCI chronic complex illness process. And we could do a better job for you if you recognize these symptoms, start learning more about the mast cell. You can know what foods to avoid, what you can do to take care of yourself. There are several different herbal and botanical supplements and other things you can take to help as far as that goes, vitamin supplements and pharmaceuticals if necessary. So, in summary, first step is to remove all toxin exposure. That's very important. We cannot remove what we cannot identify, however, so the ERMI or Hurts Me Too testing with a Swiffer cloth is important. Home inspection can also be useful, especially if the Swiffer testing comes back positive. Obviously, this will take time, so we don't just sit around twiddling our thumbs waiting for the results. We start working on you immediately to try to get you better as fast as possible. So the first medication that we really want to see you start using, binders, binders, and binders. Cholestyramine is the most important binder medication that we prescribe. Other binders can also be helpful, such as Wellcall. Clays, charcoals, the Michael Gray detox protocol will also be useful. You may want to do a good cleanse. Binders don't work well if you have chronic constipation issues. Uh, we have an article on how to do a cleanse in our Apple library. Just look up cleanse uh, and follow the directions there. 
There are also some good articles on our um, table of contents document that have to do with phase one and phase two detoxification, which is also an important part of how to do a good cleanse and get everything opened up and moving the way it's supposed to. Omega fish oils. Core Omega is the tasty choice. That's the one I like after each meal. Low-dose naltrexone is also very, very important. So with low-dose naltrexone, everybody has their own sweet spot. 50 milligram, take a tablet, dissolve it in 10 ounces of water. That will give you 5 milligrams per ounce. One shot glass holds one ounce. So for the first week, every morning, please take a quarter shot every morning of the cholestyramine dissolved in water. The second week, you take a half shot. The third week, three quarters of a shot. And then the fourth week, you can go to a full shot. Now, here's the tricky part. If you found that you did better last week at a lower dose, that's your sweet spot. So revert back to the dose that works best for you once the current dose seems like it's not working as well as you would like it to. That I cannot emphasize enough. Very, very important. So you definitely want to be ready to go as far as that's concerned and use the right dose for what you need to get back to your sweet spot. Methylene blue. Methylene blue, the maximum dose for this is two milligrams per kilogram. It's used to treat cyanide toxicity. At low doses, it helps restore mitochondrial function. We always, with complex chronic illness, want to start low and slowly work our way up as far as the dose is concerned. So what I recommend, start with 10 milligrams, one to two times a day, maybe one, one dose in the morning for the first week, take it twice a day the second week, maybe take two in the morning, one in the afternoon the third week, and then one twice a day the following week. If that's all tolerated well, then we can go up to 25 milligrams and repeat the process. It helps with fatigue, achiness, brain fog, etc. Now, at higher doses, it can kill Lyme disease and cause other issues as an antimicrobial. Killing Lyme can cause herxing. Okay, so you may start feeling bad because of what's going on. Another important couple of caveats on methylene blue. It can stain your clothing and turn your clothes a little bit bluish. And if you've ever looked at a color wheel, you'll see that yellow plus blue will produce green. This will give you green urine, which is great for St. Patty's Day. But don't be surprised if you look in the toilet and all of a sudden you see it's full of green urine. That's not the end of the world. It's something that just happens with this medication. So we will start low. We'll slowly work our way up. And that's how we use the methylene blue. As far as lab studies, again, LabCorp is our preferred lab. Uh, we use Quest if insurance companies require. We break it into two sets of labs. Set one has a turnaround time of four weeks, set two of two weeks. So please follow up, get your lab work done as soon as you can after your initial appointment, because your next appointment a month out, we want to make sure we have all of your lab results so we can go over everything. Don't delay getting your lab work drawn. Hurts me too, or ERMI, preferably the ERMI, testing of your buildings can also be very important. Other labs, as indicated and discussed for your particular situation, Please don't forget to do your pre-visit questionnaires. They need to be done prior to all future visits. We track and trend that information to help figure out where you're at in your disease course and what we need to do to help get you moving along better. There will be one for the SIRS follow-up exam. This is not the free SIRS screening test. It'll be the SIRS follow-up. It'll be in the third column, the rightmost column. You'll see in the middle column, there's a free screening test for both SIRS and Lyme. You don't want to do the SIRS screening. You want to do the SIRS follow-up test. That's important. In the middle column, you'll also see that free Lyme screen. We'd like to get that done before each appointment as well until Dr. Ornbrink tells you to stop doing those tests. A VCS test might be uh, periodically asked to be updated as well, just so we have a better idea of how you're doing with everything. Follow-up appointments. Please study, read all these papers, emails, all the information is provided. Okay, keep your follow-up appointments. If you have questions, you can probably find the answer in the paperwork or email, if you have a telemedicine visit, that we sent you home with. If it's not there, look at our website. If it's not on our website, look in the patient documents, information, table of contents. If it's not there, send me an email. If it's a real urgent emergency, you can call the office, but generally emails work best for us. 
So I've given you a lot of information on an overview of what to do. I've tried to keep it as straightforward as possible. Please go through this several times. This is complex information. I did not get it in one read over. I'm sure you won't either. Just be patient with yourself. Thank you.